we just click here again. I don't know why it's doing that. <coughs> let's 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 test this before. Yeah, ah, yeah, yeah. Things work. All right. Um, a Midsummer Night's Dream. Uh, lovers going into the woods, a strange country. The wood as a area where things things happen, and they meet someone who is a bit nasty. I don't know who it is in this, in this analogy, called Puck. Puck uh, is a fiend. Puck is making life difficult, and Puck is nasty. And one of the lovers has been turned into uh, an ass. And sometimes in these days you can sort of feel in a, to be an ass. And he's appropriately named Bottomed, but luckily for him, the lovely Titiana is still interested in him, and it all ends well in the end. So. But then, who among us is Bottom? And uh, <coughs> you can feel, well, as you can feel bereft, you can uh, have a sense of loss with all the Brexit things going on. And I, when I read the uh, the paper uh, or the uh, the introduction to this session. I have to confess, Pete, especially I sort of saw your phrasing in it and I was a bit miffed because it almost seemed that if the only people there losing things would be uh, UK archaeologists, while at the same time I'm very much uh, thinking uh, that I would lose things as well. And that also tells you about the emotional value of that. Uh, yeah yeah, 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 I know. But there are some wordings in the text I'm thinking, hmm, is this all about the UK? And I have to say that I uh, would uh, bemoan the day that I would not be allowed to go in the UK or any other part of the um, European Union uh, for whatever reasons, because I'm very much aware that as an archaeologist, I'm made by my experience outside of my borders, the borders of the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a European archaeologist, that's the way I perceive myself, and I have matured thanks to, well, talking to lots of poor people, uh, not only the people in this room, but also outside. So there is something to gain there, and therefore something to lose. There is anger, there is emotion, and if you talk to archaeologists in general, in, uh, uh, well, almost everywhere, we tend to be on the side of the remainers or rem remoters, if you like that way. It uh, is an interesting travel. It learns new words. So two weeks ago, I never even heard about this word. Perhaps I should have more paid more attention to the constitutional ways of uh, the British Parliament. But uh, a uh, <coughs> discontinuing of a session, in a sense, a discontinuing of uh, of a relation as well between us. Emotional bunch archaeologist, and therefore the, uh, you get these mean things. And uh, archaeologist against the Boris. Well, but then you have to ask you, what would it help if we sort of all tremble on Boris? Uh, well, we have a Boris less, but in the end, this whole drive for Brexit is not Boris related. And this, this whole idea of depicting someone else as a Nazi or calling him a fascist or whatever is also not very helpful for your personal narrative. Whatever Boris does, I want to have a relation with other archaeologists across those borders, how strengthened these are. And is this something in European archaeology, in the history of European archaeology. Let's go back to the year <coughs> 1936, a year which some historians say started World War II. Well, we can agree on it being a prologue or an intro. The Spanish Civil War, the Italian, the Second Italian Ethiopian War being fought. It is all a, a well, a nasty place in time. Uh, there are these tensions and expectations during the Berlin Olympics, and strangely enough, I put it in Sorry, the film *A Midsummer Night's Dream* won an Oscar, 
And you would say, oh, that's great news. There was a big row about it. So even that was, was not help. 1936 is not a nice point in time. But at the same time, 1936 hosts one of the most successful archaeological conferences with an international flavor ever. The Congress International des Sciences Préhistoriques et Proto-Historiques. Sorry, my French is atrocious. But, uh, Excuse my French. And also, by chance, it was an organization uh, uh, that was meant to uh, bridge gaps. Uh, and in Bern, 90 years ago, uh, in, well, perhaps this place, but somewhere around here, uh, the reglement, the rules were put up. And the first successful session was done in, uh, in London, 1932, with 639 participants, and in Oslo, during the same year, well, the work seems to start to burn, uh, it was well attended. I couldn't find the numbers. I know there were less people there, but still it was more than 400 at least. I have to thank these gentlemen from Romania who wrote this uh, in our article. So I found it. So I have heard about it, but then if you uh, want to have the sources, then it's pretty difficult to get this material done. Yeah. The BAR on Antarctica. And if you see the sentiment, I wish to point out that everyone, uh, I just found quotes on, uh, uh, is speaking French at this stage. Uh, the French was the linea franca of uh, uh, European archaeology. And here we have Charles Reed, who is the president of the first Congress. And he tells us that he assures that the London Congress has resulted in a close ties of friendship among scholars of all countries and in the removal of what remained of any divisions between us. So, there is war there, there is hardship, but the archaeologists have found each other. It's even a bit stronger, four years later in Oslo. Oui, nous allons partir convaincus de, de la possibilité et de, de l'importance de la collaboration internationale dans nos sciences, sciences, sciences. Yeah. si éminemment internationales, les sciences de préhistorie et de la protohistorie. Sort of okay. That's an answer to Cosina. Yeah. yeah. Uh, eminently national discipline. The same one. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And he translates in that sense that yes, <coughs> the end of the conference is there, but he's totally convinced that there is an importance of international collaboration in also international uh, sciences, the science of prehistory and protohistory. There was at this stage a very strong belief that the archaeologists of Europe would have a sort of a counterculture and they would be able to bridge all these things, all these divides, all these borders, which were then strengthening itself and making international work together. Well, these are nice words, but then if you look at Princeton Graham Clark, I have to say at this stage my, my whole presentation collapsed thanks to E.T. work, so you have to look at Burger uh, for uh, the rest of the presentation. Um, Clark um, is a, a prime example of someone working across these borders. He, from 1931 to 1937, he, he visits all over uh, uh, northwestern Europe, from Sweden, Denmark. Uh, he visits uh, Germany tr uh, twice. He goes to Poland. He talks to Polish archaeologists. And the effects of his visits are so big that, to my amazement, I discovered that in 2014 there was a special congress on the influence of Clark on, on Polish archaeologists with a bundle of this, his material. So there was something there, and I have been very lucky that the father of Dutch archaeology, uh, Van Giffen, uh, to just use the short version of his name, uh, was in correspondence with Germans, Italians, French, English, Irish archaeologists. And in more than one language. So there was literally the word people connecting with other people and working together on research uh, across all these borders. So, difficult situation going on to these borders. But now we move to the blessed time when there are no borders. Uh, I want to introduce you to the idea of a Euregio, Euregio's uh, EU Regio, is uh, a system where across a national border you make connections with each other and you uh, sort of make differences between the law systems 
very small. It has to do with the European program of Interreg. And one of the most uh, famous ones is the area where three countries have decided to do this. Germany, the Netherlands, and Belgium. It's the Maas Rhein uh, area. It is a large area with a historic continuity as well. And if you think about the prehistory or the Roman period or the high medieval period, there are great connections in that area. So in 1976, it is decided to go with that kind of a, a, an area of, of protected or and promoted working together. And uh, you would say that's, that's wonderful. But if you look at the literature, for instance, for the Roman period, and you look at the, the, the uh, study of Roman land use, you will see that the modern borders are in high influence. The Belgian studies, although they speak about the land use in Northwestern Europe, only go to the national border, while the systems of the land measurement and the regular forms cross into the Netherlands. The same can be said that the German articles on this thing also speak about the northeastern Europe, but only talk about the German forms of Roman land use. Well, there is no German form of land use, but those areas. And there is no connection from both sides to the part in the middle, where the excessive big villas of Furendal, etc., are which are connected to all these other uh, Roman stuff. So amazingly, till this day, even with all the removal of borders, there's hardly any connection between the researchers of these things. So there is a total freedom to move. You cannot find the borders. These people meet each other on, on receptions for the new year or uh, shake hands or uh, like each other, but there is no collaboration. This is a bit of a negative. The same thing, uh, EEA has been very busy in, in uh, committees about the connection and transnational working, working across borders. So you think what happened in uh, when the time when we needed people from other places in the world to come work, for instance, in Dutch archaeologists, archaeology. In the end, I looked uh, at it again, and in the, uh, the late 90s, early uh, 2000s, uh, we had three very big projects. And in the end, approximately 22, to my count, uh, British archaeologists came over. And then you sort of think how many of them stayed in the Netherlands. And the answer is three, and two in archaeology. There is hardly any movement in that direction. Nowadays, there is a very large project in the uh, UK known as Heartspeed 2. And they're desperate, they're desperate for people. And you sort of ask around how many Dutch archaeologists uh, are there, and the answer to so far I can say is three. Yeah. So um, the amount you are able to move, but are you willing to move? And the strange thing is that the border in itself <coughs> seems to play part in hardly any roles. You can move these things around, you can have this idea, you can like British archaeology, and almost every Dutch archaeologist will say, oh, it's great. British archaeology is much better than Dutch archaeology, and then all kinds of sentences come around. But then you would say, well, what's keeping you to go into heaven and cross the pond and uh, work on the other side? Or, academically speaking, uh, the idea of the North Sea culture. The North Sea culture is uh, uh, this idea that, that modern civilization comes up on both sides of the North Sea, so, academics should be working on it from, well, British and English uh, sides and work together. There's no research being done on this stage. Uh, this is not so much as a negative, but also a, 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 a strange outcome to my mind from the success story of the British and Dutch uh, universities. Uh, strangely enough, uh, the British and the Dutch have had the highest success rate of getting money from the EU. So therefore, partnerships in European context has to be done with groups outside of the leading countries. So the Dutch are leading in most things, organizing projects, and the British are. And you cannot both be at the same time leading. So therefore, you sort of avoid each other and you go in coalitions which don't work together. <clears throat> so you can be very successful, but then even sort of cling to your border. What to do about it? A future perspective. I personally, whatever happens in the strange world of Brexit politics uh, uh, and it makes good television, 
there will be great films about it uh, in, uh, in five years' time or so. But regardless of what is happening, regardless how hard the border will, I will try to stay involved in British archaeology. Yes, it's on the periphery. Yes, I want to work there. That's probably very difficult at this stage. But I will be there. And the big question is not so much what borders do for us, but how much we want to invest in each other. Do we want to become part of each other's story? And you see in the example of the, the 1936 is that you could almost become hopeful from it that if the problems and the borders and the divides between you are very strong, there's perhaps also a willingness to engage more with the other side. In that sense, you could be hopeful and say, well, maybe this gives us a chance to sort of rethink our relations and rethink the possibilities to work together. In general, British and Dutch archaeology like each other. In general, we want to work with each other. But now is perhaps the time to have this dream or this idea become actual fact. In a sense, there is nothing which stops us apart from our lack of interest to, well, make true what we already have been preaching for the last 30 to 40 years.